The Y Curve with Phil Dobby and Roger Hearing. Jetting off to sunny beaches, the thrill, the glamour of air travel. Not this summer. Just felt flat and then I thought I've got to tell me, my little girl and my boy that we're not going on holiday. That's why you work all year. There was, there was so many disappointments. There were kids crying everywhere. There were just families having to tell their kids that they won't go in. And there were adults nearly in tears. It's been a miserable summer so far for those trying to get away. Endless queues at check-in, last-minute cancellations, lost baggage. As post-COVID, no one has enough staff to process passengers. So whose fault is it? Neil Sorohan, Ryanair's chief financial officer, told the BBC his finger is pointed in one direction. The airports themselves, uh, they had one job to do, and that was to make sure they had sufficient handlers and, and, and security staff. They had the schedules a month in advance. But that's nonsense, the CEO of Heathrow Airport, John Holland K told Sky. The issue is the ground handling staff, which are employed by the airlines, has not increased at all in the last six months. And that is what needs to change. And so many of the issues that I've had passengers writing to me about, complaining about late delivery of bags or, or late cancellations, are because of that lack of ground handling resource. And the government, Transport Secretary Grant Shapps, told the BBC the industry just needs to get its act together. I do think when someone's bought a, a ticket uh, for, a, for a flight, uh, they've every right to expect that flight will take off and not find that flight's then being uh, cancelled. So, you know, clearly airlines should be cautious about not overselling these flights. Where there are problems, they need to fix them um, quickly. So too many people travelling and not enough staff. It's a problem around the world, it seems. Not just because of COVID. Here's Derek Constanza from the US consulting firm Oliver Wyman talking in 2017. Our data indicates that by 2022, demand will outpace capacity. And then by 2027, we're going to need even 10% more technicians. So staffing has been an issue brewing for some time, which raises the question as to whether airlines actually have a sustainable business model. Stephen Kavanagh was Aer Lingus CEO back in 2017. Here he is talking on PBS NewsHour. It's, uh, there's no doubt that the business is cyclical. And there's no doubt that the industry over many years has had difficulty in returning its cost of capital to shareholders. <laughs> By difficulty, you mean it hasn't? <laughs> it hasn't. And then there's the elephant in the room. Overnight, another wave of destruction. The Oak Fire more than doubling in size to 14,000 acres. Now the state's largest wildfire of the year, ravaging everything in its path. Bushfires are becoming more commonplace. Britain's highest temperature has rocketed over 40 degrees centigrade. Everywhere, it seems severe weather events are becoming more commonplace. Um, and it's very important that we accelerate R&D into zero carbon flight. But none of these solutions which are on the table or on the horizon for decarbonizing air travel are capable of scaling at the speed which is required to meet our climate change commitments. That's Leo Murray, a co-founder of the climate change charity Possible, which is why Greta Thunberg always refuses to travel by plane. I am not telling anyone what to do or what not to do. I'm just doing this because I want to do this. Really? Greta Thunberg not telling us what to do? So the question we're asking on the Y curve is, has air travel for everyone had its day? Are we returning to it being the reserve of the elite? Given the cost, the hassle and the damage to the planet, would it be better for everyone if there were fewer flights? And what does that mean for the airlines who are already struggling post-COVID? That's this week. The Y curve. So there we are. We're going to talk about flying. The uh, air flights to nowhere, the airports that lead you, well, they start off being hell and then well, heaven knows once you get in the air. But don't you feel as though the whole thing, you know, although the, the travel industry is having a difficult time of it, just trying to meet the, the demand that we've got this year, uh, that it's all going to get sorted out next year. We'll meet some in the middle. Maybe this year, you know, if we go through a global recession, then we're going to be, there's going to be less travel. So the, this issue about there not being enough staff around is going to become less important. But then if there's less travel, there's less money going into the industry to keep mm. it going and the costs are still going up with all the price of oil. I mean, Come on, we have got you on a bad day today, know, haven't we? I but know. I mean, it's about, over time, I mean, it is cyclical. I think one person in that, that introduction there was talking about how cyclical this industry is. 
and it is and won't it bounce back again because the drive for us to get away particularly in the UK obviously where we need that sunshine is so huge that the people are the, the, if the demand is there then the airlines unless are we go other ways I mean you know the train and, and you know getting across the channel but of course that's been a total disaster yeah uh, try, in, try in, getting yeah, 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 ye
who is directly employed by the airline just to oversee everything because he or she is familiar with, so, with their processes. So the point in all this then, Alex, is that someone has erred. In this case, you're saying it's 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 the, the airport. They got rid of people during COVID. They simply haven't been but, swift enough to get them all back on again. But the, yeah, but the airlines got rid of people as well, didn't they? And that's one of being, being the criticism against the airlines is that they laid off too many staff, obviously because they just didn't have the money. Uh, and and secondly, you know, are they paying enough money to try and get those those people back? So I mean, it's uh, I mean, and they're, they're not whiter than white, are they? The airlines? No, in this? no, no, absolutely. You're you're completely right. When it comes to the redundancies, of course, it's the airlines that were guilty of the most redundancies. Now they would then pin it on the government and say that they were cornered in such a position with, without as help as much help as other sectors or as much help as other aviation sectors across Europe who received these kind of big bespoke financial packages that never actually occurred in the UK. The UK's aviation sector um, suffered the worst of all of Europe, the data now confirms. And so they would argue that they were pushed into those redundancies. But of course, when you have airlines like British Airways removing a third of their workforce, 13,000 skilled staff members, you know, here we are just over a year later and they're scratching their heads wondering why there is no one about in Terminal 5 to, to move the operation. So how long is all this going to go on for then, Alex? I mean, is this just like endless? Because we obviously got the summer's going to be busy. Uh, but one imagines if they haven't got enough people and it takes a while to train up people, it could go for months and months and months. We know that Heathrow is saying they're going to have this cap of 100,000 passengers per day well in, well, they're saying, potentially into the beginning of next year. Well, I think IATA is saying next year, I think it's going to be back and hunky-dory, aren't they? Well, they, I think it's easy for them to, to, to say that without, you know, just kind of relying on a bit of hope. But the reality is, I mean, I wrote a column back in January this year warning that airline staffing levels were anything but normal. Yet that had not stopped airlines from selling a complete blockbuster full schedule summer 2022 only for them to arrive to June, July and realize they have no staff to deliver everything they had sold, which in turn triggers all those cancellations. So we have to be realistic. We have to be having these realistic conversations in knowing that disruption is going to continue for as long as there is a staffing shortage and for as long as it continues to take a while to bring on new recruits. And that really pushes us well into the winter of this year. You know, I don't see things really stabilizing properly until then. And then, of course, not forgetting everything else that aviation is inherently exposed to. Winter is a very difficult time for an airline, regardless to whether there's been a pandemic or not. And um, and with, you know, warnings from the Bank of England about a looming recession, the cost of living crisis worsening and, and luxuries like a holiday, you know, it, it, you get the perfect storm and you can build a very quick picture as to how this probably isn't going to be over any And the soon. money they haven't got in from all all these cancel flights and all these restrictions have been put on them, that's going to be in there as well. I mean, if the summer doesn't work for them, then their their coffers are empty, effectively. Absolutely. And they're worried because summer is what carries air, most airlines through because typically that you know demand really falls in winter. Now, demand is still supposed to be OK-ish for this winter period, not least because a lot of people are still using what is their money in the airlines bank in terms of vouchers and trips that they've postponed for so long. So demand is still set to continue at a relatively stable pace. But there are concerns as to how everything else, such as the cost of living crisis, the price of fuel and so on, will really affect the winter coming up. So I'm sure you've had a look at the uh, the stats on flight radar. I don't know whether that's a, a good source of looking at how many people are flying. But I, 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 they, so the seven day moving average for commercial flights on the whole planet was 108,000 flights a day. Uh, in 2019 at this time, it was over 125,000. So 16% more back then. So that's how far down we are since since the pandemic uh, that's how much we've bounced back this of course was supposed to be the big bounce back wasn't it you did sort of almost be thinking well there's latent demand if anything we're going to have more flights than we had uh, the year before the pandemic but 16 percent less and yet i'm sure you know the, the the demand is there people would love to be flying because they haven't done it for so long Absolutely. The demand is definitely there. And actually, it's just an industry that is unable to cope with this surge in demand. But all roads lead back to that staffing shortage that I that I've spoken about, because that's the you know, aviation is an ecosystem to be able to get someone from A to B. The number of different parties involved is, is almost endless. And what aviation is so exposed to in an ordinary year, combined with the fact that it has no manpower, 
um, at the moment. We're really seeing the effects of that. And that's why we've got the queues. That's why we've got the cancellations and so on. Why were they selling so cheap then? I mean, if you've got a lack of supply and great demand, yeah. then you just push your, ja- your prices up, wouldn't you? Well, that's what they've done now. But of course, it's too little too late. Now mm. they are actively begging passengers, please don't book new flights on our because we can't we can't cope with the, the bookings that we do have unprecedented for airlines that were doing the media rounds you know during the lockdowns and begging passengers to return to the airport well, once they were safe to do so let me i've got a great example of that because i'm going off to australia i'm, I'm part part australian uh, just my my left it, leg it, up, which, no i think it's that's, from the neck up actually, the neck like up, yeah, that's right yeah the, the good looking bit the um so uh, we're, we're, family's going back to australia at christmas we bought tickets in january on malaysia airlines because they were the cheapest out of the decent airlines that only stopped once and it was for four of us family of four three thousand five hundred pounds if i try and book that same flight for those same dates on malaysia airlines now it's twice that amount and the cheapest airline i could find that only had one stop is 50 percent more than we paid so we bought at the right time because you're right those prices have just shot up now haven't they Absolutely. And that is because, as I say, there is a, I mean, before, and I could, I've got access to kind of these systems where I can see what airlines are putting on as their inventory to be, to be able to sell. And a few months ago, it became very obvious that they were actually limiting those cheap affairs because they were slowly starting to realize we can't really cope with this. Now they're being much more upfront about it. Now we have airlines emailing passengers saying, we know you've got a booking, but if you really don't need to go, that's fine with us, which is territory that we, we really wouldn't believe it's, we would be. It's weird. And Alex, let me, let me put something to you, because I think there's a, there's a wider picture in all this, which we want to get into. I mean, at the moment, if I'm thinking, will I go fly somewhere? Well, I'm going to go very, ho- probably horribly early, pay an inordinate amount of money, end up sitting at an airport for probably, well, who knows how many hours, going through a really unpleasant process. And even the interior of airports at the moment um, is not normally that great, but it's worse now in all probability. So have inordinate delays, possibly face cancellations at the end of it. Aren't people going to say, hang on a second, why do I want to do this to myself? A holiday is supposed to be pleasurable. They are. And this, this is the dangerous conclusion that a uh that, that so many people will be coming to where, and I speak to people all the time or callers that call into radio shows and, you know, one in five, I'd say off the top of my head, are kind of giving me the, the that's not for me. You know, I don't want to risk it. Why would I put myself through that? And that's not a good look for the sector that's been trying to, you know, rebuild trust and, and spent so long convincing passengers, yes, it's safe to do so. You, you can come out from your homes now and now only to be able to, you know, not deliver everything that they had sold. It's given the whole industry Um, a a bad name recently. And that's why I also take a lot of issue with this blame game. Who is it helpful to, to have the CEO of Heathrow Airport sit and say, it's the ground handling agents company, it's their fault. I mean, how uh, how does an average family of four in the UK What do they care as to the setup of the airport? All they care is they have parted with their hard earned cash is it something they're going to be able to deliver in terms of getting them from A to B? They don't care about the setup of the airport or the fact that people missed emails warning about a staffing crisis. Now, somewhere, it's probably in the loft, I'm not quite sure where, I've got an old timetable I picked up when I lived in Australia from Imperial Airlines uh, from the days nice. of the old flying boats. So Australia in 10 and a half days, it used to go. It used to go from uh, Sydney to Darwin, Singapore, Only. Calcutta, uh, Karachi, Cairo, uh, Castel Bento, which is in Libya, Rome. And of course, you stayed in a hotel. A lot of those you know, big hotels that were built in those cities were built for the air travel. Uh, I'm sure that was an experience and only 10 and a half days to do it but travel in those days uh, different ball game but even more recent i mean some of the pictures you see on twitter i think it was of scandinavian airlines in the 60s and these enormous seats they're bringing around a smorgasbord of lovely food for people sitting in them and this is economy yeah i mean the actual experience even when you're on the plane i've saw a horrific suggestion again on twitter this week of these double decker seats i don't think you've seen these but you're virtually sitting above the other passengers (laughs) Uh, it's like some horrendous square bus. I, I don't know how to describe it. People won't want to do that. So are we going to reach a, a point, Alex, do you think where we, we find that, you know, air, air travel is more expensive, but it is a bit more glamorous. So we travel less, but we airlines put more, more money well, into Fewer credit. people travel, but people who can afford but, it. Uh, yeah, or, you know, people perhaps save a bit longer, so they travel less often. But we, ha- we have a better experience from it. Are we, going to fi- are we going to sort of meet that way so that they've got a bit more money coming in and they're providing a better experience for it? 
Do you want the honest answer? I think I think I know you're going to say no because yeah, people just want to travel. It's a no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's quite a safe no, and that is because you know the cost of air travel is going to sadly increase. That's less to do with what's going on now, more to do with this fluctuating oil price. And what happens when that does happen is that while it affects the pumps and the fuel pumps that we know that we're refueling our cars with almost immediately, it takes a while to trickle down to aviation and then to trickle down to fares that ultimately the passengers end up paying for so the cost of air travel is going to increase that's not going to equate to better onboard service or more space for you on board you're still going to have to pay a premium for that but what i will also add is you know what you just mentioned about that double decker seating concept please let us make sure nobody shows ryan <laughs> ceo michael o'leary we can't let him get his hands on that imagine imagine well air new zealand is going the other way though because they're trying to say well look we're going to put uh, beds in economy class so you can uh, yeah. so they are sort of stacked high and you can sleep in them for four hours or or whatever and then i don't know who changes the sheets but they give it to somebody else i mean that's a i mean that's innovation isn't it that's the because i would it love is. to be able to it lie is. flat and i don't i can't afford but it will cost stuff, you so. i guess even in economy and yeah. i mean the, the point in all this is, is flying going through a, a different phase because in the 60s and 70s was the period of the growth of mass transportation particularly from this country um are we getting to the point now where that is just no longer going to be the case and we're going to have fewer people flying just as a general thing well, if the cost of air travel increases and, and steadily increases and remains that way, then, of course, you drive out a whole market that would, other, that would otherwise be traveling and, and, and wouldn't be able to afford to, which is not the direction anyone wants to see air travel going, because air travel is much more than just taking someone to their holiday once a year, for example, but is, is about connectivity, is about making sure that the earth remains a smaller place. And think of all those markets globally that haven't even had the chance for their aviation sectors to prosper yet, like on the continent of Africa, like on, in East Africa, where they've got the fastest growing airline on the continent, Rwanda of Rwanda, and they're making great progress. And then they're hit by all kinds of, you know, a pandemic and climate change pressures and so on. So, you know, the trend in, in direction for years now has been that it's becoming more affordable. But in turn, those seats are becoming tighter. The onboard service has slipped to below what it was in the 70s and 80s and so on. But it's something that actually people do not see, the majority of people do not seem phased by. No matter the seating options, no matter the onboard service, no matter what airlines can offer, 90% of people are still only booking depending on who is the cheapest when they do a comparison online. Yeah, absolutely. And and some airlines are making profits now, aren't they? So I think United Airlines have just announced they made a profit in the last quarter. So some are bouncing back. Definitely. Uh, but, is, but I mean, generally, you'd be thinking who would invest? It's almost, It almost seems like investors in airlines are airline fanatics because you look at the, the amount of risk involved in it and you'd be thinking, yeah. if I could put my money anywhere, the airline industry seems like a really bad Bad bet. And the business industry, I mean, business flying has been the backbone, yeah. really. And and what we've learned during COVID, uh, along with many things, is how much you can do without leaving the office or indeed your home. So maybe that's Absolutely. vulnerable as well. Absolutely. Two, two things there. So the first thing is Richard Branson very famously said that the fastest way to make a million is to join the aviation business and start with a billion. Yeah. And, and, there, and there you have it. <laughs> and the, uh, the follow up to that, of course, is is business class is for so many airlines uh, or the concept of business travel rather is the backbone the bread and butter of being able to make those you know ma make that money with the margins that business allows airlines to, to sell at um, but the truth is is that the dynamics of business travel will have been changed for the foreseeable because of covid and i even think back you know i can speak personally on this it would be very ordinary for me pre-pandemic to um, wake up, go to Heathrow, and I'd have the first meetings of the day in Frankfurt and then take the flight direct from Frankfurt to Madrid to meet another delegation that evening. And then in Madrid, maybe I wouldn't stay back to London Heathrow and then back home all before it gets dark. Now, that now, post-pandemic, I mean, uh, I'm young. I don't have the energy because well, mm. I know that I know that there is a, a different way to do that now. You know, it, for the really, really short haul, one meeting, nothing else attached to that meeting. We have been introduced to the way of working remotely. And, uh, and I think that's definitely had uh, and will continue to have a big dent in business travel. But the, the flip side to that is, is that there is pent up demand for business travel. People do crave face-to-face. -face. I've just been at Farnborough over the last week, Farnborough Air Show, one of the biggest aviation trade events on earth. All the global players flocking to Farnborough, 
craving that face-to-face -face interaction and those sanitized handshakes and so on because it's something that we've all been starved of. So really, airlines are not too worried about those impacts, but it's definitely having an impact somewhere and will continue. Yeah, it's certainly busy at the farm, but it kept me awake most of uh, last week just <laughs> saying, <laughs> we're not uh, that just far down the road, farming. no shortage of anything flying very fast and very and loud. The other impact locally here, because we're in the uh, heart of the, the Surrey countryside, is that uh, the, the countryside's been dug up for this new uh, aviation pipeline going from Southampton to uh, uh, to Heathrow Airport, which is an all above uh, above ground pipeline that they're building. So, Well, someone that someone that? clearly thinks there's money in so that. So there's got to be, yeah, so there is investment happening. I mean, that's for sure. But on the on the investment side, I mean, for airlines to actually make money and to be profitable, I mean, a number of times I've read over the last decade that they really need to keep on investing in their in in their aircraft because aircraft yeah. is becoming cheaper to operate. But if we're in this sort of climate, it's very hard to be buying new aircraft if you've got an uncertain future, isn't it? So the, the, the some of those benefits uh, are, are going to disappear. And of course, some of those benefits weren't just for the airlines themselves; they, they were also for the climate. You know, they were using up less fuel, they were emitting less. Uh, carbon into the atmosphere yeah. uh, are, are we seeing are we going to see that stall that process stall now thankfully not and i can say that with confidence because so many airlines including those that are not yet profitable since the destruction of the pandemic they are still placing new aircraft orders mm. airlines big and small and they are doing so because you have to do a lot of forward planning when running an airline including what fleet or the state of your fleet will be in 10 years time and how that will align with climate change goals how you can boost your efficiency economically of course that's for the airlines that's a priority but also environmentally because luckily they now go hand in hand and so there's been a lot of investment and there were big orders placed at Farnborough. There have been some real significant orders placed um, in the last few months. And I think every time I bring this up or I tweet this, there's always a kind of response saying, well, that's quite amazing because they expected these airlines to be so fragile. The last thing they're thinking of is what they're going to be flying in 2030. But thankfully they are. And that's good news, economically speaking, but more importantly, as aviation meets its climate change goals. Well, let's pick up on that because that is the sort of third leg of all this really, which is... Is it in the end better not to fly because of the amount of damage it does to the climate? So in a sense, if fewer people are going to fly, if the aviation industry is going to change, is that actually going to be a good thing? And are the aviation industry taking that all on board? Well, I think we have to maintain perspective. Aviation is responsible for around 2% of total global CO2 emissions. Now, that's 2% that shouldn't be kind of airlines shying away from or the industry shying away from because it is still two percent mm. um but, but but i think it's far too simplistic to be able to state well let's just stop flying or let's significantly reduce flying because you target people that don't fly very much in that or you're targeting those that are flying a lot but for valid reason because their job consists of, of flying around the world a lot for different reasons and we i think it's less practical to get into the nitty-gritty of well why is that person on the plane now and far more practical to look at the options available to us today and over the next five years and find out is my airline doing that are the is the industry signing up to that in the way that it can reduce emissions and there is believe me there is uh, as you probably know there's a lot of talk about we can do this and we can do that but i often sift through what is actually kind of actionable now and something like sustainable aviation fuel which is a concept that is a fuel that basically started its life as a cooking oil somewhere or as plant waste and you pour this fuel directly into aircraft that are already flying today they don't need to be modified in any way shape or form so the passengers the just bring that with them do they when they would just bring your cooking oil uh, <laughs> which, quite, before you get on board not, again let's not give it as, as a kind of ancillary extra you know add-on idea uh, but, ryan but air could be is, listening they could be exactly exactly but what you have is you with the use of something like saf as they call it sustainable aviation fuel you have emissions reduced by 80%, almost from the beginning. And at the moment, the cost of SAF is very high because the governments haven't yet subsidized it. Only the energy companies, the energy giants, are selling it at quite a high price. The moment you get a collection of governments coming together and saying, right, we're going to subsidize this because this massively reduces our emissions as an industry, then that becomes cheaper for the airlines. And then the likes of you uh, and I are able to go on board knowing that actually this aircraft is, em is emitting 80% fewer emissions than, than it would this time last year, just because of the fuel that they have chosen on board. Now that's without all of the 
flashy innovation stuff to come, the hydrogen aircraft, flying electric, supersonic, hypersonic, and so on. So I think, you know, there is a practical conversation about what can happen today yeah. to enable us to fly guilt-free. And that, that pipeline I was talking about, you know, you could actually just have little... Uh, points where people could tip that uh, their oil in, couldn't they? <laughs> this just, this just, is all just... going a bit into the area of fantasy, I'm afraid, Alex. <laughs> well, let me, let me, maybe this is an area of fantasy, and you might both think, oh, he's talking like a complete crackpot now, but if we now. get... Now? We, well, particularly on this point, but I mean, there's, there is a danger, isn't there? Maybe in a decade, we start looking at rationing. Climate change becomes such a big issue that we start to say, okay, we are going to ration the amount of carbon credits each individual can have. And this isn't, you know, my idea, but there's the, this idea that's been tossed around by some quite notable people uh, so it's not just crackpots that we all have a carbon allowance uh, for each month or for each year and once we've used it that's it it's gone unless we want to buy them off somebody else so that, that sell out. It, yeah it, exactly if you've if you've not used it if you're the lower income bracket and you want to sell it to rich people so they can afford to fly more then you can do that and you'll get some you know some financial benefit from doing that but the idea of all of that would be rationing ultimately to actually say well okay that we're putting a ceiling on the amount of uh, of carbon emissions full stop and we're going to reduce it every year the airline industry unless it is very innovative is going to is, is going to struggle with that aren't they definitely i mean that's that's the worst nightmare and at the moment they kind of seem to say oh that's not, not for the planet that they, that they, <laughs> well for, for the airlines they go, i mean it's their worst nightmare mm. but um but you're right this isn't something that is just being passed around on twitter this is something that was mentioned at the world economic forum not yep. too long ago and um and yeah, I mean, I guess we would have to see how something like that would work, knowing that there would always be some kind of alternative. And, you know, and it, I don't want to do the whole what about but with aviation being responsible for 2%, I would strongly suggest that we see the same follow up with the meat and dairy industry that is responsible mm. for 30%, with fast fashion that is also responsible for around 20 to 30%, and the way these big brands would rather burn that stock rather than donate it or reuse it and so on. You know, aviation has always been this sexy poster boy job to be able to go onto it and, and attack it from a climate change point of view. And I don't think that we should take the stance of some in the industry where they say 2% is nothing because 2% is still 2%. But there, as I said, there are measures and there is action that can be taken, but it requires in the government legislation, it requires subsidy, it requires harmonization. And at the moment, everything is so fragmented. I'm not sure when that's going to come. Yeah. So the whole thing, we're, th we're talking about the big beasts in all this, but I'm just interested, Alex, you were saying about how you took, you know, used to go Frankfurt to Barcelona and back here. Did you ever feel, am I flying too much? Um, so there definitely came a point where I, I would say this probably towards the end of 2018, where I was very consciously aware that I was on an aircraft every 72 hours. And the, the reality is that I wouldn't have been on that aircraft for no reason. And also almost none of it was for leisure. So I would actually long for it to be to be leisure, to be able to you know have some downtime. So, but it was just the way in which aviation is shaped up, and and meetings were face to face, and appearances were also face to face, and therefore that's that's how it worked. But what I did start doing at the end of 2018 to be able to respond to these questions, not listen media rounds and so on, is all of my flights were offset. So I was carbon offsetting every single flight. Um, basically, you know, you've got those big offsetting schemes that means that it kind of makes it neutral by uh, offsetting the number of, of journeys that you're doing and so on and the trees that are planted. And, and I also sifted through to make sure it was a genuine one, a legitimate one. I was going to say, so, it's a big, there's a whole new program about that, isn't there, to how legitimate yes. some of those schemes are. Things, but it's, but yeah. So yeah. it's been great talking to you. I guess the final question is then, I mean, are, it is that question around bouncing back next year. Are we going to find that we are going to be travelling as much? Is next year the year that it, it, it sort of equalises out and we find ourselves travelling as much as we used to uh, with enough staff employed in the industry paying price that we that we are used to and airlines back to making profits or is that just too well, much to hope for demand is definitely there demand is strong and international air travel is recovering in almost all markets on earth currently except china so to, you know demand is really there whether or not it's going to be a smooth summer next year entirely depends on the staffing levels and whether or not the industry is able to successfully recruit, which it's having a hard time doing because when you pin up two jobs and the salary is very similar to that, that somebody can obtain working for a supermarket like Audi, for example, but the difference is Audi doesn't have the 3.30 a.m. shouting <laughs> passengers from the delays. You know, you can see how it's having a hard time right now. Yeah. 
um, you know, and notwithstanding the fact that aviation is inherently exposed to everything. Nobody yeah. saw Ukraine coming. Well, not, not everyone yeah. at least. And, uh, you know, so it is something that people have to keep in mind. I wouldn't want to make a, a guess. I'm hopeful that um, demand will continue to be strong and that the industry is heading in the right direction in terms of recovery. Now it all comes down to those staffing numbers. Yeah, yep. COVID-23, oh monkey, God. Monkey, oh God. Black monkey swans, swans. 2.0, world war A giant black swan will appear <laughs> from somewhere, almost certainly. <laughs> Alex, thank you so much uh, for being with us uh, and talking about this fascinating subject. And uh, yeah, we, we're now ready, I suppose, to go off and fly anywhere on our holidays, aren't we? We are. Good to talk, Alex. Pleasure. Thank you so much. So there, I think he did a fairly good job of our proposition that the, the whole industry is completely stuffed and actually turned around and said, no, it's all going to be fine. Don't you worry about it. I suppose. I suppose. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't really believe that no one's going to fly anymore, but I just think there's going to be some rethinking about a lot of it. I yeah. mean, I'm personally wondering whether to go, you know, if I can go somewhere by train or boat, I think I'd rather, but the time in factor is a bit of a problem, I suppose. I think the industry just probably has to get together and, and somehow promote itself as being actually a, a, a more uh, pleasant way of travelling. That the would be to, nice. Yeah, and, to, and to get rid of these visions we have of these horror stories that we've all been through. Anyway, but next time on the Y Curve, yes. we're going to be talking about gas. We're going to be gassing about There's gas. There's one fact. turbine left on the Nord Stream pipeline now out of Russia. And of course, Vladimir Putin is saying, oh, you know, we had, how many did that start with? Four, yeah, I think. No, to the double pipeline problems. And it, Yeah, exactly. Technical you know, problems. And if you, the interesting thing is you go to the Nord Stream website yeah. and it talks about the reliability of supply and how yeah, the infrastructure yeah. is sound. But all of a sudden, doing? strangely. Well, there's a great Russian word, which I love. You have to look very grim and go kasozhlenyu means I mean. unfortunately so if something goes wrong you go kasozhlenyu right, and well, I think there's a lot of that going maybe on we right now call that the episode next week because we are going to look at uh, European gas problems and how are we going to cope with it If because uh, Putin seems like he's doing a very good job of constraining supply so that uh, reserves can't be built up so that we go into the, the winter period there'll be a lot of freezing Germans the will, uh, or giving some ground to, to Russia. Uh, and, you know, will we be forced well, to do that? it's probably more politics and economics, but we'll dig into it next week on The, the Why Curve. Curve. All right, thanks for listening this week. We'll catch you then. Bye. The Why Curve.